Well, defect, the host atoms are replaced by foreign atoms or impurity atoms. So remember, that's the two very important point defects. And we also learned two equations. The first equation here tells us the number of atoms per unit volume. So we can always use this equation to find out how many atoms inside of a cubic meter cube. And, but in order to use that equation, we need to know the density, the Avogadro uh, number, and, and the, the atomic weight. So that equation can help us to find out the number of atoms per unit volume. And the second equation, it's an equation help us to find out the number of vacancies inside of um, material, materials, any materials. So that means we always have missing atoms in, in crystal structure, then that equation will help you find out how many atoms are missing, ideally. And in order to apply that equation, you need to know EV, sorry, QV, that is the energy required to have that vacancy. And the vacancy couldn't just appear itself. In a it requires energy to pull that atoms out. Um, K, it's a gas constant. That constant has two different values. One's in the unit of joule per atoms um, times Kelvin. Another unit is at the unit of EV per atoms times Kelvin. Right, those are the things we did last time. And today we're gonna to continue our lecture. Okay. We're gonna talk about more on substitutional and interstitial impurity. Okay. All right. Give me a second. Let me see if I can fix this guy. Never mind, doesn't work. All right, in that case, I'm afraid, you guys in the front, you have to watch at the screen on both sides of the classroom. Yeah, feel free to move to another seat if you feel like that is necessary. Okay. Right, just we'll start with substitutional impurity. Okay, remember what does substitutional mean? It means the atoms, draw a quick schematic to show how that looked like. If we have a crystal structure, I'm drawing the host atoms. So all the black colored atoms are, let's say, those are copper atoms. We use another color. Blue one, the blue atom is Nickel atom. Okay. So if inside of the crystal structure, 
one of the host atom is replaced by a nickel atom. And this type of impurity, it's called um, substitutional impurity. But there's a couple of rules. It couldn't just happen for any atoms or any materials. You have to follow some rules. So the rules we have to follow, it's called Homey rule three rules. R O T H. So apparently this guy probably developed this rule. So it's named after him. So the first rule is the atom size. The radius of atoms um, has to be similar. Imagine you only have, if you have a lattice, you couldn't really fit in a very large atom to have this substitutional defect. You need to have a substitutional atom that has a similar size as the host atoms. So the difference in atomic radius has to be within plus minus 15%. So the difference between radius has to be within plus minus 15%. So what happens if we have a super large or super small atom replace that host atom? So if we have something too small or too big, we're gonna have something that's called a new phase formation. Yeah, we're going to talk about this in later on in chapter 9 or 10, phase diagram or phase change. So materials could have different phases, depends on the temperature, the concentration. So if we have very large or small atoms get into the site, it could change its phase. So make sure the first rule is make sure the radius is within plus minus 15%. Second rule is the crystal structure must be the same. So what do I mean by that? If the host atoms has a crystal structure of F FCC and the substitutional atom, the materials must have the same crystal structure, FCC, in order to fit into that, look, um, to replace the location of host atoms. So they must share the same crystal structure, either both FCC or both BCC, or they can both be HCPs, but they must be same. And the third rule is the electron negativity. The electron negativity need to be close. So we learn this word electron negativity. Oh, it's back online again. Wonderful. Um, we learned that word electron negativity from chapter two. And electron negativity is really based on where the location of that elements on the periodic table. 
And so for this rule, it requires electron negativity to be similar or close. That means on the periodic table, these two elements near must be close to each other, either next to each other or nearby. You cannot, you can't have an atom, elements from left hand side, another one from right hand side to form this substitutional uh, defect. So they must be nearby or next to each other on periodic table. What happens if uh, the electron negativity is not very close to each other? What if they have a huge difference in electron negativity? One's from the left hand side, another one's from right hand side. Remember why it's called electron negativity or electron positivity. That means the elements either very easy to gain atoms or gain electrons or lose electrons. So if you have one is very positive, another one is very negative, what is happening? When they meet together, they love each other. If they fall in love, then they react. So they will react to each other and form something new. That's not called impurity anymore. That's called a chemical reaction. So here, make a notes. Otherwise, if they're not similar to each other, they will react to form new materials, new compounds. And it could be the intermetallic reaction, which means there are two metals. Yeah, two metals can react with each other. An example will be titanium aluminum, aluminum titanium. Okay. That's the third rule. The electron negativity has to be close to each other. And the fourth rule, it's a valency. The host atoms The host atoms tend to dissolve metals with higher valency. We're going to talk about example about what do we mean here. All right, here I use the word dissolve. That sounds like you use liquid to dissolve something. But in, in this course, we do. Yes, we do use the terminologies from liquid dissolve something to describe how solid dissolve each other. So. Make a quick notes here. So far we're done with the rules. Those are the four rules for substitutional impurity. Let's do a quick notes on alloy. That's the mixture of metals. And for mixture of solid metals, we have solvent, we have solute, and we have solid solution. So the solvent, it's your host atom. And that means that's the atom that is majority.
and the salute it's the minor elements or impurities they dissolve in the solvent a good example would be iron that's the host atom for steel and copper it's the impurity atoms that's a minor element dissolved into the solvent so solid solution is when the solute is uniform uniformly distributed in solvent Okay, so those are the concepts for solid solution. Yeah, we do use solution for solid stuff. Then it sounds weird. Okay, now let's go back to look at the four rules. Now you have an overall idea. If we want to have a substitutional defect, those are the four rules we have to follow. And here is a quick, it's an example of the substitutional defect. Copper plus nickel. Okay. So let's first look at the first rule, the radius. The radius of copper it's about 0.128 nanometers. And the radius of, of nickel, it's a little bit smaller. It's around 1.25. If you do a quick calculation, the time, the difference in radius is way less than 15%. So they're pretty good. Nanometer. Okay. Another one is crystal structure. Copper has FCC crystal structure. And nickel happens to have FCC as well. So they, are, they match, the crystal structure matches. That's a good sign. Next thing, the third rule is valency. Okay, the most common valency for copper is plus one. For nickel, it's plus two. So nickel is a little bit higher than copper. That's desired. If you go back to look at the rules, yeah, the host atoms tend to dissolve metals with higher valency. So if they can make a choice, they would prefer to dissolve metals such as nickel other than other metals who has similar valency plus one or zero. Oh, nothing has zero. If we're talking about metal ions. Okay, now let's look at, yep. If we're looking at a solid solution, Copper would be the majority element, right? It is called solvent. So in this case, nickel, it's a minor element, which is a um, solute. So once you have all the rules list out for those two elements, you will find out and copper will tend to dissolve nickel in its crystal structure to form the substitutional impurity. 
And that also gives you a, a clue. If in the future you want to design an alloy, you, you think, oh, they would be cool to dissolve this metal and this metal together. Then you can use these rules to figure out if that is possible. Check out the radius, check out the electron negativity, and also check out the valency for each material and use the rule to see if it is a feasible plan. Okay, this is about substitutional defect. Now let's look at interstitial solid solutions. Okay, I'm drawing an example of a host crystal structure. The black color atoms are host atoms. The red. The red colored are um, interstitial impurities. So for this type of defect, the impurity atoms cannot fit in between the void space between host atoms. So they don't replace the, their, the host atom, they simply just fit in between the empty space. We, we learned previously, there's so much empty space in crystal structure. So if you have a small enough Impurity atoms, you can always get fit into those empty space. So for this type of in defect to happen, the impurity atoms must be very small in order to fit in between the interstitial um, site space. So that's easier, very straightforward. It must be very small to fit in. And the second thing is, um, <clears throat> with this type of defect, you're adding extra atoms in the crystal structure. You're actually adding crystal strings. You're adding tension compressions inside of the crystal lattice. So you're adding more stuff and so the space gets they're, they're, everything is crumbled and so there's strain and stress going on inside of crystal structure. So the introduced lattice string could be very small. If your impurity ad atoms is very small, it's not disrupting the space, the interstitial space. But if we have a fairly large atoms, the impurity atoms, that can disrupt the pattern and regularity of the lattice and to create a fairly large lattice string. Okay, yep, that's, that's the interstitial solid solution. So for point defect, we have substitutional and interstitial. 
And for interstitial defects, there are a couple of rules, so it's more complicated. But for the interstitial defects, as long as you have something very small that can fit in, and that could happen. So it, that's why it's super hard to have pure materials, since you will always have some impurity fit in between empty space. All right. Any questions on point defects? Okay, I have a question. If we have gold, um, could, could, could silver get mixed into gold? Depends on the size. If you have a textbook, I think on one of the tables, it shows you all the radius that can help you tell the size and also tell you the crystal structure. Yeah, actually, silver and gold, the, the size, the radius wise, are pretty similar. So they're within 15%. And crystal structure are the same. Should be BCC, I guess, or FCC. Um, so they can get mixed with, with each other. And how about, can titanium atoms get mixed into gold? That must be really cool. A very expensive metal plus a very hard metal. I would love to have a ring that's made from titanium plus gold, but it's unlikely. So I forgot what crystal structure gold has, but at least I know titanium has HCP crystal structure. That's a hexagonal closed packed crystal structure. And gold definitely doesn't have that crystal structure. So they couldn't really get mixed with, to each other for substitutional defect. All right. Okay. So if on your homework or in exam, um, ask you if there's two, this if substitutional defect can happen for certain metals, and you can use that four rules to decide if that is going to happen or not. All right. So next two things we can learn. We're done with point defect. So next thing is linear defect. So for linear defects, we have two different types of linear defects. One, one is called edge defects, edge dislocation. And another one is called screw dislocation. Dislocation, I think I spelled it wrong. Okay, it's back on. Okay, um, it's pretty hard to just talk what is the edge di dislocation and school dislocation. So I found two videos that I could help you kind of visualize what is going on for linear defects. So the point defects we just introduced is kind of zero D, right? Happens at and random points inside of a uh, crystal structure. For linear defect, it's kind of 1D. So you can have one line that has this defect. Let me share my screen. Right. Yep. 
Oh no. Yep, that's a symbol for edge dislocation. So this symbol tells us some inform useful information. If we have a symbol inside of a lattice, above the symbol, it tells you there's compression. 
And below that symbol, we have tension force, tension stress. So a good example is, let me draw a, a lattice. Imagine if we have a dislocation, edge dislocation occurring Now I have a example for inside of a crystal structure. We're having this edge dislocation. As you can see, the first two rows, there is an extra half pen. This guy here is an extra half pen. Um, it, there's no atoms that can bend up with that extra pen. Let's do that. First two rows are perfect crystal structures, and the bottom two rows are perfect crystal structures. They're in, since they're inside of the same crystal structure, and there's deformation occurring, and we're ending up with an extra half plan. of atoms. Now we can use that symbol for edge dislocation. Okay. So, okay, we have an edge dislocation right there. And above the symbol, we have compression. Below that symbol, we have tension. Four minutes left. We don't. I don't think we have a time for another video. But let's see. okay, we'll stop here and we'll continue this topic on Wednesday.